In our Bible studies lately, we've been talking about how the Bible was written, looking at what the Bible says about itself. And so we're starting in the Old Testament and thinking about what the Bible says about who wrote it and when it was wrote, written and where it was put and how was the, the Bible written according to the Bible. To start today, I have on your sheet, and it's up here on the screen, a list of the books in the Old Testament. <clears throat> For you who've been coming the last five weeks, which books of the Old Testament have we talked about? We talked about the Book of the Law, which were the first five books there, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They were all written by... Moses. Moses. Right? It seems like that's the earliest part of the Bible that was written down. Those five books are often referred to in the Bible as the book of the law or the book of Moses. All right, what other books have we talked about? Psalms. So we talked about Psalms. Which person especially wrote many of the Psalms? David. David. So King David wrote many of the Psalms. Good. Last week we talked about three books. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. Who wrote those? Solomon did. There's one more book that we kind of talked about. I'm really hoping somebody will remember. Maybe not. Joshua! Good job, Terry. Joshua. So after Moses wrote the book of the law, the next leader was Joshua. We read sections of Joshua talking about how much Joshua followed the book of the law. And then it ends by saying Joshua wrote down a bunch of things, which we would think would be at least most of the book of Joshua. And we talked about Psalms with King David and then Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. All right, if you look at what we haven't talked about yet, we haven't touched on most of the books in the history section. You notice that? Okay. One of the reasons is a lot of the books in the history section, we don't actually know who wrote them. And since they're history, those books often cover hundreds and hundreds of years. And so like First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, instead of just covering one person's lifetime, they're covering many, many generations. And so we don't know exactly who wrote some of those books. The other books we haven't talked about yet are all the prophets. And we'll get to those in the coming weeks. Last week, we talked about Solomon. And we said Solomon actually wrote three whole books of the Bible, which I don't know that I often thought about. Solomon actually wrote a lot of the Bible. Can you just give me a summary of what each of these books is about? We read a little bit last time. The book of Proverbs is full of wisdom. I was, thought somebody would say Proverbs. <laughs> Not smart Alex here today, which is good. The book of Proverbs is full of wisdom. And why was Solomon a good one to write the book of Proverbs? Because God made him wise. The Bible tells us that. All right, and what's the format for much of the book of Proverbs? Poetry, oh. yeah. How about, Contrast. is it big sections that go together, or little wise sayings? Little wise sayings. I think that's just important to know when you, you read Proverbs, you kind of, sometimes you say, well, this doesn't seem to all hang together. And you're right, it's not the goal. It's just one, one wise saying after another, often contrasting a wise person with a foolish person or a a righteous person with a wicked person. All right, how about the book of Ecclesiastes? How would you summarize what Ecclesiastes is all about? What did you say? I said life. Life! It's all about life. That's, that's accurate. And what conclusion does Ecclesiastes make about life? Meaningless. Life is meaningless. That's most of what Ecclesiastes is all about. Life is meaningless. And we said that sounds kind of pessimistic. Maybe a better way to say it, though, would be that that's very realistic. realistic. Right? 
It's realistic to realize we can search after all sorts of things in life. Maybe there'll be some joys that last for a little while, but ultimately, none of it is going to fulfill us, except for what? At the end of the day, what should we remember? You can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. That's, a, that's kind of a negative thing we should remember. You can't take it with us. How does the book of Ecclesiastes end? We, we read this last time. It ends with the phrase, remember your... Okay, you, you obviously didn't remember, but the book is kind of to remember. Remember your Creator. Remember your Creator. Now you remember. Okay, and so, don't be surprised when life doesn't fulfill you the way that you really expect it to. And at the end of the day, remember your Creator. Remember God. Keep His commands. This is what life is all about. And finally, Solomon also wrote Song of Songs. I was talking with someone before class. Maybe in some Bibles you've seen it as Song of Solomon, which is the same thing. So there's different names for the same book, Song of, Sol Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. And what's that about? It's a love story. It's a love story between a king, who we would assume would be Solomon, and his wife. And so it's a beautiful love story. Any questions about what we talked about so far? So let's move on. If you open up to page two on your study sheet, it says, Not wise enough, Solomon's downfall. We talked last time about how God made Solomon so wise and he made him wealthy and he wrote these books of the Bible. And one sad thing in the Bible is that Solomon, with all of his wisdom, fell away from God. And what that did is that impacted all the rest of the history of the Israelites. Solomon falling away from God. And so we're going to start by reading that. So 1 Kings chapter 11. I told you to open up to 1 Kings. So turn to chapter 11. So we've got this wise King Solomon who writes down all this wisdom and yet, especially in one area of his life, he was not very wise. And so 1 Kings chapter 11 says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, they were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them, because they will surely turn your hearts after their goodness. <coughs> Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth, and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely, as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites, he did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David my servant and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. 
So it's kind of sad to read all this. And it's unexpected. After hearing about Solomon and his wisdom and writing these parts of the Bible, and Solomon had one area of his life where he was not wise. And it was with his relationships. And so, it's hard to believe or even understand how this works. But how many wives did Solomon have? 700 wives. And if that weren't enough, how many concubines did he have? 300. 300. And now, of course, this is not a good thing, but concubine would be kind of a woman that you take as your own, but you don't call her your wife, which was never God's plan either. And so he has a thousand women that he's basically married to. And this isn't a good thing, because how many women is a man supposed to have? What? You knew that. Good. Just one. Just one. Right? It kind of makes us wonder, why do you think Solomon wanted to have so many wives? So maybe there was just this sexual desire part of it. And boy, I'm king. I can do whatever I want to. And there's a lot of beautiful women in the world. And, huh. I can, I can take as many as I want. And it works. Right? And it doesn't really matter whether they're happy or not. I'm the king, right? That was probably part of it. And it says though that he held to them in love. He held to them in love. So that, that's one place you wonder, what does the word love there mean? Right? It's probably not self-sacrificing biblical love. Okay? He wanted them though. That's, that's true. He wanted all these women. Can you think of other reasons other than just sex that maybe Solomon would have taken so many different wives? Yeah, political alliances. Political alliances. We talked about that a little last time. The first wife that's mentioned is a daughter of Pharaoh. And it seems, well, that makes sense. He's trying to protect the Israelites from the, the Egyptians who are very powerful and strong. And so political alliances, it mentions all these different nations. Okay, any other reasons you could think of? None of them are good, of course. I'm guessing there was there was something to, to show for just his, his power and influence. And again, this is not how we're supposed to think, but the more wives he has, the more important he seems to be, the more power he seems to have. And he has all these wives. We're never told how many children Solomon had. But you imagine, he must have had a few children, right? With all of these different wives. And of course... Then, and maybe a little now, just having children is seen as a blessing. And so he's going to have all of these children and build up his family line. And So you could think of, perhaps, twisted reasons why he would do all this. I would say pride. Pride. This pride is to show how powerful and important he was. How did God feel about Solomon's actions? He was very displeased. He was very displeased. And he was angry. Why was God angry? Because he told him not to do this. Because he specifically told the Israelites not to do this. Right? And, you know, sometimes in life when we do something, we know it's wrong. But we kind of, we think, well, maybe I can, maybe I can find a way that this is okay. Right? For Solomon, there was no way that he could possibly explain this as being okay. Because God had specifically said, do not marry women from other nations. And God had said, why? Why weren't the Israelites to marry women from other nations? They're going to lead you astray after their gods. And somehow Solomon must have thought he was, he was wiser than that. Right? He was wise that that wasn't going to happen. And yet, did that happen? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, and so what God was concerned about happening to every Israelite family now suddenly it's happening to Israel's king on a huge, wide scale. And it's kind of strange. You learn the names of a lot of false gods in this section, don't you? And so whom did Solomon build altars to? Asterisk. Asterisk. Molech. Chemosh. Well, you can pronounce it however you want to. It's a false god. You can even mispronounce it. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, but these are these are false gods. We hear about them in the Old Testament, but always in the sense that this is this is absolutely who you're not supposed to be worshiping. 
And Solomon sets up idols and little shrines to all these different gods and it leads his heart away from the Lord. Agree or disagree, when we sin, God punishes us. It's kind of a hard question, isn't it? Right now, by nature, just not thinking about what the Bible says, by nature, do we feel like God punishes us when something goes wrong? Yes. Yes, we do. And so just naturally, when something goes wrong, what's one of the first thoughts in your mind? Well, what did I do wrong? Or why is God doing this to me? Okay, now we know about Jesus. And so when you think about what Jesus has done for us, what does that lead us to think? Well, God forgives us because whom did Jesus... Whom did God punish for our sins? He punished Jesus for all of our sins. All right, and so sometimes as Christians, we really lean on that side. Well, God doesn't punish us. It's all forgiven in Jesus. When you read the Bible, does God actually punish people for their sins? Yes. Sometimes. Does he ever punish us as we deserve? No. No, because what do we deserve for our sins? Death and hell. Okay, and that's, that's does not treat us as our sins deserve. But are there consequences? You could even sometimes call them punishments when when we human beings sin? Yeah. 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 Right. If you, you could just start with Adam and Eve, they sin. Did God forgive them? Yes, God immediately promised one of these descendants is going to crush the devil's head, right? And then what did God tell them had to happen? You have to leave the Garden of Eden. You've got to work for your food. There's going to be pain in childbirth. You're going to have conflict in your marriage. All right, and so they're both true. All right, God forgives our sins through Jesus, but sometimes God disciplines us. Could even say God punishes us. And so God tells Solomon, Solomon, there's there's gonna be a consequence. Because you have sinned against me in this way, what was God gonna do? I'm gonna rip your kingdom away from you. And you think if Solomon had had all these wives because he wanted power or influence or importance, God says, the very thing that you think you're accomplishing, I'm gonna take that all away from you. Because you've turned away from me, your, your family is not going to rule over all of Israel. I'm going to take your kingdom away from you. But amazingly, God still gives him a promise. I probably would have said, you're just done. Right? It's all over. Find it somebody else. But God actually gives him two promises. What does he say? Your kingdom's going to be torn away from you. But, not in your lifetime. Because of what? Because of your father. Right? Out of my grace to your father, I'm not going to let the kingdom be torn away from his son. It's not going to happen in your lifetime. And second, so, Right, the whole kingdom's not going to be torn away. How much is going to re- remain in David's family? One tribe. one tribe. And a pretty important one, because what city was God going to make sure stayed in David's family line? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And so, you see this, really a punishment for his sin, but yet you see God's grace. Because you've fallen away from me, the kingdom is going to be torn away from your, your son. But I'm going to allow this not to happen during your lifetime and your, your descendants are still going to reign over one tribe, over the tribe of Judah in Jerusalem. And I said this had lasting impacts on God's people because did it actually happen? Did God tear the kingdom away from Solomon's son? Yeah. Who was Solomon's son? Rehoboam. Terry is two for two today. Wow, I said, you know, without Jonah here, somebody's got to pick up the slack. <laughs> Terry is doing it. This is great. Solomon's son was Rehoboam. And God 
gave most of Israel to another man with a very similar name. Jeroboam. Jeroboam. And so Jeroboam was one of uh, Solomon's officials. And Jeroboam is the one who gets the rest of Israel. And Rehoboam is just left with the tribe of Judah and Jerusalem. And do they ever get reunited? No, they never do. There's never again a United Nation of Israel until 1948 when it was done politically after World War II. But never in Bible times was Israel one nation that ruled itself again. All right, before we move on, what lessons can we learn about a true Christian marriage from the story of Solomon? There's many blessings to what? Being true Christian, what for one man, one woman? So, let's start with the basics. So, a Christian marriage would be one man and one woman, not one man and a thousand women. Right. One man and one woman. And God promises to, to bless that. Right. Good. What else can we learn about Christian marriage from Solomon's bad example? Excellent. That it matters who your God is. And now, of course, in the Bible we hear of marriages, and it happens today too, are not both spouses. They don't share the same faith, and a Christian can still be a Christian. But you see this idea that to have a spouse who shares your same faith in the true God, this is a really important thing. Right? And when you have children or grandchildren thinking about marrying someone, make sure that they have that in their minds. Okay, it does happen to me as a pastor that sometimes a, I've had couples come to me either like for marriage counseling or like they want to get married and okay, and we'll sit down and talk and um, so so what do you what do you believe? And they'll say, We never talked about that. And it's like, how long have you been dating? Well, we've been dating four years, we've been engaged for a year and a half, and but you've never talked about what you believe or church. Or God, no, it just, I guess that's never come up. And I would encourage your children, make sure that comes up. Right? As they're thinking about, who am I going to date? And maybe someday, faith in God matters. Anything else? It's just one thing that, that strikes me in, in uh, Proverbs mm -hmm. is that I don't know if it's three or four times that Solomon brings that a complaining wife dripping faucet. And about four times he talks about, mm -hmm. you know, how difficult it is. And with 1,000 to please, it's not possible. So Nana brings it up. I wasn't going to bring it up. But Nana brought up, uh, in the book of Proverbs, there's a number of Proverbs about how difficult it is to have a bitter or a quarrelsome wife. And Nana says, you know, Solomon had a thousand wives. This, he maybe understood this. In a big way. Right? And so, just if you read the book of Proverbs, it gives a lot of advice about marriage. And one of the things is that a, a wife can really harm a marriage when she's constantly bitter and complaining. Better to live on the corner of the roof than with a quarrelsome wife. That's one of the Proverbs. And <laughs> yeah, what about the husband part? We just read about the husband part. About God had things to say to the husband about what he had done. And so you know, maybe we can learn some things from this man. I just was reading something that was a Christian was talking about marriage and he, 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 was, he said something like, and I never thought about this before, but you can always find someone who you think is better. So if you're married right now, you can find someone who looks better than your spouse. And, you know, can we, this happens, doesn't it? You're going to find someone who's better looking. You're going to find someone who at least seems to be kinder or more sympathetic. And you're going to find someone who might have more money in it. All right? And just realize that. But God's put you together with the one that you have. 
Okay. And so the this idea, well, maybe this person looks, doesn't matter. Right? God's given me this person. I should be aware that there's going to be people in life who seem better than my spouse. Right? But that doesn't change anything that the Bible says. And God's plan for marriage is still good. You just have to remember that you don't live with that person. <laughs> and part of why that person might look better is because you're not living with them. And maybe because they're not living with you. Yeah, that, might, that might make it seem better too. But just to be aware of this. It's, right? Even when you're married and happily married, it might seem like, well, that person, it'd be better if I was with that person. No, it wouldn't. Right? You have all the all the same problems or maybe different ones. And to be content and committed to the person God's given you, that's what God wants us to be. All right, we're talking about the Bible, though, not marriage. And you think, well, what, what impact does Solomon falling away from God have on the Bible? And the impact it has is that as future kings come for Israel, the new nation in the north, and Judah, David's nation in the south, what's sad is that many, many of the kings are not faithful to God. And this certainly has an impact on God's people and even on the Bible itself. So we're going to jump to the next book, 2 Kings, but also chapter 11. We just read 1 Kings 11. We're going to turn to 2 Kings chapter 11. And what we're going to focus the rest of the class on is on two dark periods in the history of God's people and how God miraculously preserved his word even in the face of great obstacles. And so in 2 Kings, chapter 11, we're going to hear about a lady named Athaliah. And it's maybe perhaps unfortunate that today's Mother's Day, but we're going to talk about an awful mother on Mother's Day. That wasn't my, my design. It's happened that way. All right, so we're going to read about a woman named Athaliah. And before we even read it, you can see I have the question, who is Athaliah? Does somebody know who Athaliah is connected to? Athaliah is the daughter of the two worst rulers God's people ever had. Does that help you? Ahab, and who's Ahab's wife? Jezebel. Ahab and Jezebel were king and queen in Israel, and they were the worst. Right? What prophet was there who was always warring against Ahab and Jezebel? Elijah. This is Elijah and the prophets of Baal and Jezebel's trying to kill Elijah and name his vineyard and there's all these stories about how wicked Ahab and Jezebel are and their daughter is Athaliah. And unfortunately Athaliah marries somebody. And so you would, I guess that's a common thing today too this marrying the wrong person thing. She marries the king of Judah. So you've got Israel with these terrible rulers, Ahab and Jezebel, and you've got Judah, which is the one who stays in David's family, and you hope at least some of their kings are going to be believers in God. Ahab and Jezebel have a daughter. She marries, who's supposed to be the believer in God, king of Judah. And so now you've got these bad rulers who've turned away from God, impacting both kingdoms of God. Is this making sense? And God, like he, he sometimes does, punishes people. God told Ahab and Jezebel that he was going to wipe them out. And he sent somebody to do that. And the man he sent to do that was Jehu. And Jehu wipes out the family of Ahab and Jezebel. He kills all of them. In the meantime, he kills the king of Judah, who was married to Ahab and Jezebel's daughter. And that's where our story comes in, that we have this moment of turmoil. The whole royal family in Israel is killed off by God's will because they turned away from him. But now Judah also doesn't have a king because their king got killed. And the person in power is Athaliah, 
who isn't from Judah and is against God. Following all that? I mean, sometimes politics today seems like it's complicated. It's not really a new thing. Alright, so let's read 2 Kings chapter 11. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she proceeded to destroy the whole royal family. And so Athaliah has married into the kings of Judah. Her son, the king of Judah, gets killed because of Jehu. And when Athaliah sees that, what does she decide to do? Well, let's kill them all. But ironically, whom is she talking about? It's her own family that she married into. And so here is an evil queen who says, Huh, well, look at this. All the kings of the Lord's people are dying. This is great. Let's kill off anybody who could ever be a king of, of the Lord's people. And then nobody will believe in the Lord. And then they can believe in my God. Who was Jezebel's God? One of them we haven't mentioned yet. Baal. Baal. Then everybody can worship Baal. See what's happening? All right, verse 2. But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Jehoram, and sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from the royal princes who were about to be murdered. She put him and his nurse in a bedroom to hide him from Athaliah so that he was not killed. He remained hidden with his nurse at the temple of the Lord for six years while Athaliah ruled the land. And so Athaliah, this evil queen who's not really from Judah, is killing off her whole family and one person gets saved. Who gets saved? <coughs> Joash. Joash gets saved. So what would be the relationship between Athaliah and Joash? Grandmother. Grandmother to son. So this grandmother thinks she has killed off her whole family. And that's what she wanted. But little Joash is saved and hiding. And where is he actually hidden? They hide him in the temple. Which is kind of ironic, because what's one place that Athaliah would never go? <laughs> the Lord's temple. She didn't believe in the Lord. So Joash grows up living inside the temple. And you kind of get the picture. He never left. It's just his boy. It's his whole life. He's in the temple of the Lord. All right, verse 4. In the seventh year, Jehoiada, Jehoiada is the high priest, Jehoiada sent for the commanders of units of a hundred, the Karaites and the guards, and had them brought to him at the temple of the Lord. He made a covenant with them and put them under oath at the temple of the Lord. Then he showed them the king's son. He commanded them, saying, This is what you are to do. You who are in the three companies that are going on duty on the Sabbath, a third of you guarding the royal palace, a third at the sewer gate, and a third at the gate leading behind the, at the gate behind the guard, who take turns guarding the temple, and you who are in the other two companies that normally go off Sabbath duty, are all to guard the temple for the king. Station yourselves around the king, each of you with weapon in hand. Anyone who approaches your ranks is to be put to death. Stay close to the king wherever he goes. The commanders of units of a hundred did just as Jehoiada the priest ordered. Each one of them took his men, those who were going on duty on the Sabbath and those who were going off duty, and came to Jehoiada the priest. Then he gave the commanders the spears and shields that had belonged to King David and that were in the temple of the Lord. The guards, each with weapon in hand, stationed themselves around the king, near the altar in the temple, from the south side to the north side of the temple. Jehoiada brought out the king's son and put the crown on him. He presented him with a copy of the covenant and proclaimed him king. They anointed him, and, and the people clapped their hands and shouted, Long live the king! When Athaliah heard the noise made by the guards and the people, she went to look. She went to the people at the temple of the Lord. She looked, and there was the king, standing by the pillar, as the custom was. 
The officers and the trumpeters were beside the king, and all the people in the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. Then Athaliah tore her robes and called out, Treason! Treason! Jehoiada and the priest ordered the commanders of units of a hundred who were in charge of the troops, Bring her out between the ranks and put to the sword anyone who follows her. For the priest had said she must not be put to death in the temple of the Lord. So they seized her as she reached the place where the horses entered the palace guards, and there she was put to death. Jehoiada then made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people that they would be the Lord's people. He also made a covenant between the king and the people. All the people of the land went to the temple of Baal and tore it down. They smashed the altars and idols to pieces and killed Matin, the priest of Baal, in front of the altars. Then Jehoiada the priest took posted guards at the temple of the Lord. He took with him the commanders of hundreds, the Karaites, the guards, and all the people of the land, and together they brought the king down from the temple of the Lord and went into the palace, entering by the way of the gate of the guards. The king then took his place on the royal throne. All the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was calm, because Athaliah had been slain with the sword at the palace. Joash was seven years old when he began to reign. You heard the story before? This is where the Bible has some pretty amazing stories in it. All right, and so we're in this dark time period where this evil queen has seemingly killed off any connection to King David and to God's promises, and, and yet there's still faithful people, which is always God's promise. There's always going to be faithful believers. And here it's the priest, Jehoiada, the priest at the temple, spares Joash and raises him, and when he gets old enough, you kind of wonder, like, why? When did he decide it was time? And I guess seven years old, that's a good time for someone to be king. And so when Joash gets to be seven years old, it's time we install the real king what, on the throne. Uh, wasn't the uh, Josiah was he king eight? So, so oh, Terry brings up Josiah. So beats, so Joash beats Josiah. We're going to read about Josiah next. He's yeah. the next story today. But Joash becomes king at age seven. We're going to read about another boy who becomes king, Josiah, later. But Joash does it first. Okay, let's just think about the main points here. As a result of Ahab, Athaliah's rampage. What two important things were in grave danger? The line of David. Why was that so important? Why did we need to have somebody remaining from the line of David? Because there's two promises from God, and God always keeps his promise. The first promise was that David would always have a descendant on the throne of Judah. So there's just a promise to David, one of your descendants is going to be king. But the bigger promise was Jesus. And so in grave day, if Athaliah puts to death all the descendants of David, then who can't be born? The Messiah, the Savior. Okay. Now the second thing kind of goes with it, but if, if Athaliah succeeds in putting to death all of David's descendants, what else is, is she putting in danger? Their faith. Their faith. And the word of God. And so if this evil queen succeeds in putting to death anybody who believes in the Lord, we, we know that God's going to preserve his word, but she's really putting in danger the word of God and people's faith in the true God. They're both in danger. Okay, and so how is Joash's life spared? So, it seems like, first of all, some ladies did it. He has a nurse, not like a hospital nurse, but like a nursing person nursing him. And she hides him. And it seems like she, with maybe some other ladies, takes him to the temple, and it's their bravery. God uses these women to save this boy's life. And so that God's promises can continue. And I say this is an example of it. You, you could put a hundred things in there, but this would be an example of one time when God's people refused to obey the government. And with the different of you and different Bible studies, we've talked about this a little lately, about how God commands believers to respect the government, even when we don't like the government, even when the government doesn't seem to be Christian. 
And we say, what's the only time to disobey the government? When the government goes against God. So Athaliah's decree to kill off the family line of David, does this go against God? Yes. And so here's an example of some women together with the priest who defy their government's orders and they keep this boy alive and this was a good thing. Right? They must obey God rather than a woman at this point. It's kind of like Moses. Kind of like Moses. Right? right. Moses' yeah. mother. Yeah. So we can think of other examples of this. Right? Yeah. You know? How Josiah or Joas the life there. I I thought maybe because he was hidden in the temple of God and she didn't want anything yeah. to do it. So so ultimately that's how his life was spared. Yeah. yeah. First the, the, the nurse mother yeah. hit him. But then for six years, he's hidden in the temple of the Lord. Right. And Athaliah didn't go in the temple of the Lord. Right. So this is a good, safe place for him to be. I mean, I would think if they're searching for somebody, six years in that one building, not even going near it. Right. I knew it, right? Right, yeah. So that was partly how Joash's life was spared too. Okay, how old was he? Seven. Seven years old. Okay, now this is where we can come up with pretty firm dates for the kings of Israel and Judah. So it seems like Joash ruled from 835 to 796 BC. That's the time period we're talking about. All right, but right in the middle of all this, there is a great verse that talks about what we've been talking about with the Bible. All right, look again at 2 Kings 11, verse 12. So find verse 12 again. Jehoiada brought out the king's son and put a crown on him. He presented him with a copy of the covenant and proclaimed him king. They anointed him and the people clapped their hands and shouted, Long live the king. This is what's cool. When jo Joash becomes king, what is the priest given? Wow! How does that fit with what we've been reading? Is somebody... Remember what Moses had said, if when kings become kings in Israel, what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to make a copy of the covenant, of the book of the law. And I think I remember, Nada, you asking when we say that, did this ever happen? And I think we said, we're not sure. We don't think so. Here's one time when it happened. And so here you've got this seven-year-old. The day he becomes king, he gets a crown put on his head and he gets a scroll put in his arms. This is the covenant that we have with God. And uh, it isn't described exactly what was all included, but we'd imagine this is probably the book of the law. The book of the covenant. You're becoming king. You need a crown on your head. And you need the Bible in your arms. And this is how you're going to be a king. Right? How is the story of Joash a powerful example of how God keeps his promises? Did it look pretty bleak? Joash should have been dead. Joash should have been dead. There should have been no son of David left. God's word should have just kind of died out. Did any of that happen? No, right? Sometimes it looks bleak. Sometimes God uses very unexpected means, but he's able to keep his promises. I don't want to bring this up, but I have to. Joash doesn't have a happy ending to his life either. Kind of like Solomon. Somebody know how what happens to Joash as time goes on? Dave? I'm sorry, was he killed in battle and decided to go? That's the next one. That's Josiah. Josiah. But, okay, so the copy of covenant, wasn't that discovery of the walls of the temple? Yeah. The time of Josiah? That's Josiah too. Okay. Yeah. We'll get to that. What's sad about Joash is when the high priest Jehoiada dies, Joash turns against God. And so here, all the grace that had been shown to him, especially by this priest, uh, Joash turns against God, and it was shown most clearly when the son of Jehoiada, Zechariah, the next high priest, goes to him and convicts him of his sin, he has him killed. And so Jehoiada the priest dies, 
And Joash falls away from God, and later on he has the son of the priest who had saved his life. He has him killed. And so here you go. Here's this man. He has all of God's grace as he grows up. But ultimately he turns away from God. And so we have more years of leaders of God's people not following God's word. And time goes on, and that brings us to the one you guys all want to talk about. You can't bring him up, which is good. Turn ahead to 2 Kings 22. So same book. Go to chapter 22. And here we have the story of Josiah. So 2 Kings 22 says Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother's name was Jedidah daughter of Adiah. She was from Bozkath. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. Stop there for a second. I have a typo on the screen. That's on your page. This should say Josiah. Right? We talked about Joash already. How old was Josiah when he became king? Eight. He's eight years old. So a little older than Joash. He's eight years old. Here's the dates when he reigns. So even though he started at age eight, he still didn't, he didn't get to reign his whole lifetime. He's the one who gets killed in battle. Not because he did anything wrong, but he ends up being killed in a battle with the Egyptians. And he's described as a good king who follows his father David's footsteps. Obviously his father David who lived 400 years before. Right? Father in the sense of Great, 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 great grandfather. <laughs> right, let's read about what happens in Josiah's reign. So, verse 3. In the 18th year of his reign, King Josiah sent the secretary, Shaphan, son of Azaliah, the sons of Meshuzalam, to the temple of the Lord. He said, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, and have him get ready the money that has been brought into the temple of the Lord which the doorkeepers have collected from the people. Have them entrusted to the men appointed to supervise the work on the temple. And have these men pay the workers and repair the temple of the Lord, the carpenters, the builders, and the masons. Also have them purchase timber and dress stone to repair the temple. But they need not account for the money entrusted to them because they are honest in their dealings. Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan, the secretary, went to the king and reported to him, Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors at the temple. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. He gave these orders to Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, son of Shaphan, Abker, son of Micaiah, Shaphan the secretary, and Asiah, the king's attendant. Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah about what is written in this book, about what has, that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us, because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written here concerning us. Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, Abker, Shaphan, and Aziah went to speak to the prophet Huldah, who was the wife of Shalom, son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the new quarter. She said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Tell the man who sent you to me. This is what the Lord says. 
I'm going to bring disaster on this place and its people, according to everything written in the book the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and aroused my anger by all their idols their hands have made, my anger will burn against this place and will not be quenched. Tell the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people, that they would have become a, that they would become a curse and be laid waste, and because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore I will gather you to your ancestors, and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. So they took her answer back to the king. So what impression do we get about the condition of the temple and the condition of God's word? Not good. Not good. Not well kept. And so the nation of Judah, they kind of swing back and forth. They'll have a godly king and then a wicked king. And then a kind of godly king and then a wicked king. And back and forth. You can imagine that during those periods when the king wasn't worshiping the Lord, what happens at the temple? It goes into disrepair. You kind of hope that the priests do what they can to keep things running the way it's supposed to, but it goes into disrepair. So Josiah, part of his being a godly king, walking in the footsteps of David, we're going to repair the temple. And he gathers money. And he lines up people. You can repair it. And just spend whatever you need to. You don't even have to give us receipts. Just go fix up God's temple. And what do they find? They find the Where was it found? In the temple. Now, we have like a children's Bible at home. And this children's Bible it makes it seem like like it was hidden in a wall or something. Like it shows workmen like tearing down a wall and oh, here inside the wall is the book of the law. That's really not how it's described. Does it sound like the book of the law was hidden? No. no. It was just sitting right there at the temple. But people were so accustomed to not worshiping the Lord that what didn't they realize was at the temple? the book of the law, they just completely forgotten about it. And now, why is it not surprising that the book of the law was at the temple? Where did God tell Moses to put the book of the law? This was from a few weeks ago. Put it next to the Ark of the Covenant. Which was? Where was that held? At the temple. And so, it seems like, now I had, I had Josiah's dates on here, right? So, we're in the 600s B.C. We're getting to almost a thousand years after the time of Moses. Right? That book of the law that's been around a long time. Moses said, keep this right next to the Ark of the Covenant. And it sounds like that's exactly what had been happening. It just, there were times when people just did not pay attention to the temple. And so, they find the book of the law. So, when he was made king, he didn't get the book of the law. He clearly was not given the book of the law when he became king. And so Joash was in a much better position. Joash is trained by the high priest and given the Bible the moment he becomes king. Josiah is not. Right? Thankfully, all of his, he didn't have quite the family entry going on. But he's not given the book of the law. And it seems like even the high priest doesn't really know about it. But still, he had been taught at least some of the things about the true God. <laughs> Alright, so they find the book of the law, and what's Josiah's reaction to hearing it? He's surprised. And what does he do? What action does he take? He tears his robes, which is what you did when you were really really upset about something. Why did he tear his robe? What did he realize? Because he wasn't given that when he was So, interesting. I didn't think of that. I wonder if he heard the part about how the king was supposed to get this. And he didn't get it. But even more than that, was Judah following what God said in his word? No. And so Josiah, here he is. He's, he's, a, he's a believer in God, but he doesn't have 
the book of the law, at least not in its entirety. And here a believer in God reads the Bible and realizes we're not following this at all. And he's really upset, and we got to deal with this right away. He tears his robe, and we've got to find out what to do. And so what's the first thing that he does after he hears the book of the law? He sends it to, I can't remember her name, and then she, she reads it and tells him what it says. He says, we've got to ask God about this. We need to inquire of the Lord. And in the Old Testament, if you wanted to know what God thought about something, who would you go to? A prophet. There were prophets who could communicate directly with God. And there's so much of this we don't fully understand, but uh, they knew who these prophets We need to go and ask the Lord what we should do. And so they find a prophet. But it's really interesting who the prophet was. It was a woman, which is very, very rare in the Bible. But here we have a woman who's a prophetess. Hold them. And she clearly is able to speak for God. And what does she say? Josiah is like, wow, well, we are not following this book. And Huldah says, you're absolutely right. You have not been following this book. And what's God going to do? He's going to destroy you. Just like he promised. Because in the book of the law, God said, if you turn away from me, I'm going to I'm going to turn away from you. And so all this is back to Josiah. Josiah, and you're right. God's people have not been following this book, and God's going to do exactly what he promised. He's going to let his people be destroyed. But there was a little promise in it. What good news did you have for Josiah? Well, because you repented. And here's a great example of repentance. Because you repented and you turn to me, this is not going to happen in your lifetime. And so, once again, God preserves his word in very unlikely situations. And so here, somehow we have the book of the law. You know, we'd like to know, is this still the original copy that Moses wrote? It's hard to imagine that lasting 800 years. But it certainly had been copied there were people paying attention to God's word. It had been copied. It was stored right where it was supposed to. And I don't know what we imagine. Maybe it's kind of like a big clay pot next to the Ark of the Covenant. We've got books in there. We've got the book of the law. There probably were some Psalms in there. Maybe Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs and parts of Joshua and maybe parts of First. And we've got we've got God's books here. It's just nobody's paying any attention to them. And here Josiah does. And he repents, and God says, I'm going to bless you. You're going to follow my word. Any questions about that? So Josiah, we're going to read the next chapter as we end. It's just described as one of the best kings God's people ever had. Maybe other than King David. No one is described like Josiah is. But, you know, God's promise about destroying his people, Josiah dies in 605 B.C. And you know who came to destroy Jerusalem, right? Which group of people? Babylonians. The Babylonians. They actually conquered Jerusalem three times. Each time a little worse. Do you know when the first time was that the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem? What year? 605. 605 B.C. And so it's just four years after Josiah dies, the Babylonians come and conquer Jerusalem and take Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego <coughs> captives to Babylon. And so, it was just like God said, right? My people have not followed my word. I'm going to destroy them, but not Josiah during your lifetime because you've repented and turned back to me. We're going to read one more chapter. I know we're reading a lot today. It's good to read the Bible. We're going to read the next chapter. We won't have a lot of time to talk about it. But you think about if Josiah is really a good king and he's really going to take to heart God's word, what should he do? <laughs> he should read it, copy it, and then what should he do? 
actually do it. And we kind of talked about this is sometimes the hard part. First, it's a hard part of actually listening to the word, but then, often harder, is actually doing it. And so here's a whole chapter of how Josiah does everything that someone should do when they find the book of the law. All right, chapter 23. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words in the book of the covenant which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in the book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. So the first thing is, whom does Josiah get together? Everybody. Everybody's getting together. And we're all going to stand here, and what are we going to do? We are going to read the book of the law. And again, we wonder, like, how much, how long was it? Was this just the Ten Commandments? Was it all the laws of Deuteronomy? Was it all Genesis to Deuteronomy, the whole thing? And we get the impression, this, there was a lot of stuff that they read. And Josiah says, we are going to hear this, and we're going to follow it. Sure. What, was the, what was the significance of the pillar? So, this standing by the pillar, the temple had huge pillars at the front. They actually had names. They were so big they had names. I forget what their names are. But the big pillars. And so I'm not an expert on this, but clearly, when the king stands by that pillar, this is something important's happened. And so when someone's made king, they would stand by that pillar of the temple, and now as they're reading God's word, they're going to stand by that pillar of the temple. It's a place of importance. Yeah. Yep, great question. All right, let's keep going. So we're going to all listen to God's word and follow it. Verse 4. The king ordered Hilkiah, the high priest, the priest next in rank, and the doorkeepers to remove from the temple all the articles made for Baal and Asherah and all the starry hosts. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kindred Valley and took the ashes to Bethel. He did away with the idolatrous priests appointed by the kings of Judah to burn incense on the high places of the towns of Judah and on those around Jerusalem, those who burn incense to Baal, to the sun and moon, to the constellations, and to all the starry hosts. He took the Asherah pole from the temple of the Lord to the Kidron Valley outside Jerusalem and burned it there. He ground it to powder and scattered the dust over the graves of the common people. He also tore down the quarters of the male shrine prostitutes that were in the temple of the Lord, the quarters where women did weaving for Asherah. And this is kind of striking. Like, how bad did it get? It was bad. They had an Asherah pole, like a totem pole, in the temple of the Lord. And all sorts of images of Baal. They had prostitutes at the temple of the Lord. And this was all. Just This is how bad it got. But Josiah says, we're following the law. What do they do with all that? They get rid of it. They don't just like put it in the closet. Right? They burn it. Grind it up. Just we're destroying this. Right? Verse 8. Josiah brought all the priests from the towns of Judah and desecrated the high places from Geba to Beersheba where the priests had burned incense. He broke down the gateway at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the city governor, which was left of the city gate. Although the priests of the high places did not serve at the altar of the Lord of Jerusalem, they ate unleavened bread with their fellow priests. He desecrated Topheth, which was in the valley of ben Hinnom, so that no one could use it to sacrifice their son or daughter in the fire to Molech. He removed from the entrance to the temple of the Lord the, the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun. They were in the courts near the room of an official named Nathan Melech. Josiah then burned the chariots dedicated to the sun. This goes on and on. Right? What were people even willing to sacrifice to their false gods? Their children. They were even sacrificing their children to false gods. And they're at the temple of the Lord. What did the kings put up? Horses dedicated to the sun. 
think this is just a mess, right? Verse 12, he pulled down the altars the kings of Judah had erected on the roof near the upper room of Ahaz, and the altars Manasseh had built in the two courts of the temple of the Lord. He removed them from there, smashed them to pieces, and threw the rubble into the Kidron Valley. The king also desecrated the high places that were east of Jerusalem, on the south of the hill of corruption, the one Solomon, king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth, the vile goddess of the Sidonians, and for Chema, the vile god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the people of, the, of Ammon, Josiah smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles and covered the sites with human bones. And We read about this stuff. We read about Solomon. Do you know about how many years Solomon lived before Josiah? So Josiah is about the year 600. When did David live? 1,000. So about when was Solomon king? 970. So how long had all these things to Chemosh and Molech and how long had they been sitting there? 370 years and nobody had bothered to tear them down. Right? And here Josiah finally is motivated by God's word. We're going to we're going to get rid of all this stuff. We're going to hear God's word and we're going to, we're going to follow it. And we're really out of time. But you should go home and read the rest of this chapter. <laughs> the other big thing he's going to do is they're going to celebrate the Passover, which clearly they hadn't celebrated for a long, long time. And Josiah says, come on, we've got to celebrate the Passover. And so here you have God's word has been found. And it changes people's hearts. And good King Josiah is one last kind of breath of fresh air. But this is what it looks like when you hear God's word and you put it into action. That's what Josiah did. Sounds like he had a temper. Sounds like he had a temper. Maybe, maybe kind of like Jesus had a temper. Remember when Jesus was in the temple and they were selling stuff? What did Jesus do? He threw it down. Like this, when, when somebody is mocking God, it's okay to have a temper. When it's for God, right? Not for us. It's for God. Come back next Sunday. Next Sunday we'll talk about some of the prophets and how God had them write God's word. Let's close with a prayer. Dear Lord God, every time we, we read your word, we're convicted of our sins and we're encouraged by your promises. Lord, we see how kings like Solomon sinned against you. They had your word and they turned away from it. Lord, help that never to happen to us. Help us to have your word, to actually read it and hear it. And then give us the strength to, to obey it and put it into practice in our lives. Well, we run about some temptations. The temptation to sexual sin that Solomon fell into. Temptations to idolatry. Just putting anything and everything over you. Help us not to fall into those sins. But use your word to motivate our hearts. Like you did for Josiah to live for you. Help your word to be living and active in our church and in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.